Thank you. 
Berta. Barat, Barat dia.
ನು ಎಂಬ ದಡ್ಡಿ
ಅಂದ್ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ವಿಡಿಯೋ ಎರಡು ಮಾಡಿದ್ದೀನಿ ಹಾ ಮಾಡಿ ಮಾಡಿ ಸರ್ ನಮಸ್ತೆ 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 ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸಿ ಮಿ ನೋಡ್ತೀರಲ್ಲ ಈಗ ಸರಿ ಆಯ್ತಲ್ಲ ಈಗ ಮತ್ತ ಎಂಡ್ ಇದು ಮಾಡಕ್ಕಾಗ್ತದ ವಿಡಿಯೋ ಆಪ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಅಂತ ಒಂದು ಏನೋ ಬಂತು ನೀವೇ ಮಾಡ್ಬಿಡಿ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಹಲೋ ಸರ್ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಆಂಟರ್ನಿ 
ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಸಾಯಿದಾಪುರ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ರಂಗನಾಥ್ ಸರ್ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ರಂಗನಾಥ್ ಸರ್ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಸರ್ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ 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 ಎಲ್ರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಏನೋ ವಿಡಿಯೋ ಬರ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ಪರವಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ಸರ್ ಓಕೆ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಸರ್ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ 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 ಸೈದಾಪುರ ಸರ್ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ 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 ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸರ್ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಸರ್ ಒಂದ್ ಎರಡ್ ನಿಮಿಷ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡೋಣ ಸರ್ ಗುಡ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ನೂನ್ ಸರ್ ಶುರು ಮಾಡೋಣ ಸರ್ ಸೈದಾಪುರ್ ಸರ್ ಗುಡ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ನೂನ್ ಸರ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ
the YouTube platform. As you know, Professor Saidapur sir is a well-known educationist. He'll be delivering a talk on biological science, some basic insights. Uh, only a few days ago, I requested sir to deliver a talk with, on biological sciences. And he readily agreed. And today he'll be delivering the talk. Uh, before going to the talk, let me briefly introduce the achievements of uh, Professor Saida Pursar. Uh, Professor Saida Pursar obtained his BSc, MSc, and PhD from Karnataka University, Dharwad. Later, he joined the, as the faculty in the Department of Zoology, Karnataka University, and became a professor in 1988. And later, uh, he served as the Vice Chancellor of the University from 2006 to 10. You, before that, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Kansas Medical uh, Center, University of Kansas, in, in 1976 uh, to 79, with Professor G. S. Greenwald. He was also Alexander von Humboldt Fellow from 89 to 90, University of Mines. He was sir was also visiting scientist at uh, National Institute Institute for Basic Biology, Okazaki. Japan and also held INSAR DFG exchange program fellowship from 95 to 2004 at uh, Ruhr University, University of uh, Wurzburg, Germany. Uh, let me uh, briefly tell the academic and research achievements of uh, Professor Saidapur. Uh, Professor Saidapur sir made outstanding contribution to <laughs> the biology of uh, uh, vertebrates with special focus on Gonadal steroid, steroidogenesis and follicular atresia, etc. He successfully evolved protocol for advancing gametogenesis vis a vis reproduction in Indian bullfrog and for producing frogs of desired sex. He studied behavioral ecology of neuron tadpoles and gamid lizards. His studies on behavioral ecology of amphibian tadpoles made significant contribution to our knowledge with reference to ideal free distribution, kin recognition, food detection, and predator prey interactions. Uh, sir has guided 13 students for their PhD, and uh, he, he awards that uh, he awards and honors that Professor Saidapur sir got our. Uh, one of the most coveted uh, <laughs> awards for in science, uh, this is Patnagar Prize in 1991. He was also elected fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore in 93, National Academy of Sciences, NASI in 2009, and Third World Academy of Sciences in 2010. He's, he's a recipient of Professor MRN Prasad Memorial Lecture Award and Professor Absorub Memorial Lecture Award of uh, INSA in 2010. Uh, with this uh, very brief uh, background, I now request Professor Saidapur sir to take over and deliver his talk on biological science and say some basic insights. What do you sir for your distinguished talk? Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. <laughs> am I, am I uh, audible? Yes, sir, you are audible, sir. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Uh, First of all, let me thank the KSTA for giving me an opportunity that helped me to recapitulate what I had learned long ago. And in the last 15 years, I have rarely given lectures. And uh, so, Ramesh uh, persuaded me that uh, now or never, because the year is coming to the end, and uh, it is better. I give a talk now. So I thought, okay, since we are addressing graduate students, I thought I will uh, give a talk such that they may get interested in biological sciences on one hand, and on the other, uh, get some basic, very basic insights in the field of biology. That is the basic purpose of my talk. And uh, I'm not able to move the slides. Uh, Mr. Anthony, you are able to 
ಡೂ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ಸರ್ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಮಧ್ಯದಲ್ಲಿ ಕ್ಲಿಕ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಮತ್ತೆ ಎಂಟರ್ ಓಕೆ ಸರ್ ಓಕೆ ಸೊ ಬ್ರಾಡ್ ಔಟ್ಲೈನ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೈ ಟಾಕ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ಇನಿಷಿಯಲ್ ಕಾಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ದೆನ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಟ್ರೈ ಟು ಹೈಲೈಟ್ ಹೌ ಬಯಲಾಜಿಕಲ್ ಸೈನ್ಸಸ್ ಮೇಡ್ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರೆಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಾಟ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಮೇಜರ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಮಾರ್ಕ್ಸ್ ದರ್ ಆರ್ ಮೆನಿ ಬಟ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಟಚ್ ಅಪಾನ್ ಅ ಫ್ಯೂ ಆಫ್ ದೆಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ದಟ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಅಚೀವ್ಡ್ ಸೋ ಫಾರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ವಾಟ್ ಕೈಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಬಯಾಲಜಿ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಫೋರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಆನ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಸೆಂಚುರಿ ಇನ್ ಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಸೆಂಚುರಿ ಬಿಲಾಂಗ್ಸ್ ಟು ಬಯಾಲಜಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಫೈನಲಿ ಆಫ್ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಮೇಕ್ ಅ ಫ್ಯೂ ಕನ್ಕ್ಲೂಡಿಂಗ್ ರಿಮಾರ್ಕ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ದಿ ಎಂಡ್ ದ ಟಾಕ್ ಸೊ ಟು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ವಿತ್ ಟು ಗಿವ್ ಅ ಹಿಸ್ಟಾರಿಕಲ್ ಪರ್ಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟಿವ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಲ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಇಸ್ ಆರ್ ಆಲ್ ಅಪ್ರಾಕ್ಸಿಮೇಟ್ ವ್ಯಾಲ್ಯೂಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಬಿಲೀವ್ ದಟ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸ್ originated some 13 billion years ago and it is very difficult for human brain to visualize what it means to imagine things in terms of billions even thousands of years is very difficult to to visualize actually what it means probably we are good at you know, 100 years 200 years things like that but billion years is too much to even imagine anyway planet earth is believed to be formed around 4.5 billion years ago and the first signs of life seems to have originated approximately 3.5 billion years ago that is 1 billion year after the earth was formed because it was all hot it was a hot soup nothing could be formed only when it cooled down uh, some life could be evolved and then as far as we are concerned the modern man seem to have evolved around say 0.2 billion years ago we are very very recent species on this planet earth then of course we come back coming back to the agriculture the field of agriculture actually man started only some 15000 years ago very recently so we are not that old compared to the all other things that are cited here now as far as the various organisms are concerned one can broadly group into two categories one is the prokaryotes another is the eukaryotes prokaryotes are minute microscopic organisms without cell organelles nucleus etc they are rarely found and appreciated because we needed the good microscopes and other things to see them even to acknowledge their presence we needed instruments to see them otherwise they are all all the time they have been there because they are the first to originate what is interesting is with all this the total biomass of prokaryotes if one takes remember by prokaryotes are not seen the naked eye the total biomass of prokaryotes is greater than the combined biomass of animals and plants yet we don't see them we don't recognize we don't appreciate but that is the quantum of prokaryotes that exists and of course because of uh, lack of instruments and equipments and techniques we were not able to see all i'm trying to emphasize is prokaryotes are as important as eukaryotes if not more in fact they could be more important as well now how did the biological science progress if we look at the pace of progress biological science progress very slowly very slowly compared to other branches of sciences like astronomy maths physics geology and chemistry and this was they all flourished long ago but progress in biological sense was very very slow this was largely for want of tools and techniques that was our biggest problem as far as the biologists are concerned in fact until 18th century if we take biology was mainly limited to documentation of biodiversity and we didn't even know what is the interrelationship between uh, different forms of life that we saw 
what is the difference between uh, say a, an earthworm or a cockroach and things like that however in the 18th century carl linnaeus a very brilliant uh, uh, scientist provided a means for orderly grouping of organisms that was one very important development in the field of biology he showed how animals could, could be different animals could be grouped and how plants could be grouped and so on and he gave us the concept of binomial nomenclature so this was very very important biologists can never afford to forget him however later in the 19th century biologists largely studied other things now earlier only documentation was the major thing then in 19th century they started working on fossils morphology anatomy physiology development etc this does not mean that earlier people did not do this before 19th century but the main focus was in the 19th century earlier interested people did dissect uh, bodies and uh, try to see things and all that that is different thing but major studies uh, on fossils morphology anatomy physiology development etc started coming in the 19th century in the 20th century the techniques became available we had uh, microscopes so and uh, microtomes we could cut sections and see under the microscope stain them and so on and even the biochemical techniques started coming in the 20th early 20th century and this all this enabled analysis of not only the physiological processes etc but tissues like liver kidney muscle whatever and then even the cell structure and function in a greater detail with reduction approach reductionism what we call that is you take the whole organism then look at the organ system then you look at the tissues then we look at the cells and so on that is the reduction process so in 20th century is highlighted by most of these uh, studies now actually there are two ways of studying biology one is either you can start from biosphere go to ecosystem community population organisms then organ systems organ cells blah 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 and all the way to genes and so on or you can go from the bottom also now you can start with the genes go up to biosphere and try to understand now till 20th century most of the studies were limited to up to the cell level and later in the 20th century with the uh, development of electron microscope and so on in uh, 1940s uh, one could study the ultrastructure of cells cell that is cell organelles nucleus etc all this could be done and in 21st century that is the current century uh, biologists are obsessed not just biologists but all those interested in biology are in, are obsessed with genomics study of genes genomics then uh, proteins and also in silico biology, that is computational biology, biology done using computers. So this is what was going on. So there are two ways. One is from the holistic organism, go up to reducing them to this level, go what we call it as a reductionism. Or you start from here, from genes, etc., and go up to holism, try to interpret uh, how the organisms uh, are made up of, how they behave, and so on. Both approaches are complementary to each other. Uh, they are not different from each other in a way, in the sense there's nothing like which is superior to the other. Both are purely complementary. We need both approaches to understand the life of organisms fully. Now, in biology, there are four major pillars on which the entire biology is now resting. For example, the first one, I can say the cell theory. This was an important landmark development in the, in the field of biology. This is one important pillar. Next is the theory of evolution, the Charles Darwin's uh, uh, theory of evolution. And then principles of inheritance, the Mendel's work. These are three major pillars. And then the final one is the principles of coding and transmission of genetic information this is ultimate the crux of the thing 
at the end of the day we want to know how structure and function of organisms behavior etc is uh, <clears throat> regulated and we all know that it is regulated by genes and if so what are the principles of coding and transmission of genetic information so these are the four major pillars on which biology actually rests now i'll take one by one different pillars of biology and try to explain a little bit about each of these the first pillar as i said is the cell theory which was proposed in 1839 just 200 years ago uh, 250 or whatever years ago uh, it is a generalized and a profound concept actually it is not just one idea it is a mixture of ideas which says that cells are basic units of all life forms that is one thing the second idea is cells arise from cells only these things appear very simple today but at that time it was not so simple one thing is you could not see anything like a cell because we did not have a microscope robert hook developed his own kind of a microscope in 1665 looked at the cork sections and said they look like a cell cell where monks sleep or a, a cells in a jail prison where prisoners are kept so he saw just what he saw with the boxes box like structures he called them cells and their matter ended he didn't know what else uh, to say about it of course he saw many other things he looked at some water tooth scraping and so on he saw some things moving some particles and other things beyond that nothing more could be done later uh levin hook another very brilliant uh, person associated with uh, actually microscopes because he ground his own glass glasses and prepared a microscope where he was able to magnify the particle like structures or whatever he could see 200 times that is 200x magnification so he could see a few things in a in a water bodies in the tooth scrapings even semen and so on but they didn't know what what that all that means for example sperms were labeled as uh, uh, worms or uh, parasites they didn't know they are sperms and they have an important role in fertilization and so on they didn't know but anyway to make the whole story short this was an interesting uh, and important contribution and everything depended on development of biology then depended on the development of technology that is microscopes we needed the microscopes which can magnify enormously so that microscopic sub microscopic organisms could be seen and then that is not just magnification we also need resolution so that we can see things more clearly so both had to be developed and that of course biologists could not were not good at developing instruments we had to wait for engineers and physicists to develop those techniques so that further development could take place anyway later uh, in 1839 two scientists botanists and zoologists schwann and schleiden developed this theory what we call cell theory this is very interesting what i want to make a comment here is observing is one thing and then making sense of what one observes is another observing is possible but you have to make a sense out of that look at the car look at other things so many things but then what do you think of that so therefore that requires the intellectual exercise at the part of the people to make sense of what one sees so that is what they did they gave us the cell theory and in fact we it is said cell theory was created and not discovered and that of course looking and thinking makes biology a creative process this is the point that i would like to drive home to the students that was one thing then of course uh, around 1865 virchow brought out a new idea till that time we didn't know how new cells arise so he said de novo de novo so somehow new cells are produced 
but that was wrong apparently no abiogenesis can take place like that it has happened once perhaps long ago 3.5 billion years ago but doesn't happen again and again so easily and uh, virtue said that all cells arise from pre-existing cells only there is no other way that's what it said so these are major developments associated with the cell theory and there are a few more uh, which i as i proceed i will mention about that it a related aspect of cells is the discovery of structure of cell membranes see cell membrane structure is extremely important because all cellular activities take place on the cell membranes it may be plasma membrane maybe mitochondrial membrane golgi body whatever so it is ultimately a membrane structure on which synthesis degradation transport whatever aspect has to go through cell membranes only so understanding cell membranes is almost 50% of understanding life and 50% is genetics how genes function now they showed that the singer and nicholson said in 72 that the membranes are made up of lipid is a mosaic structure basically of a lipid bilayer in which proteins are and cholesterol are embedded proteins for to provide strength on one hand and to provide uh, what you call uh, as a, a functional proteins for helping transport etc and then cholesterol again would provide strength otherwise the membrane without cholesterol and without proteins would be very fragile and subjected to leakage and then of course carbohydrates are there mostly outside the cell membrane which have a role in recognizing foreign structures antibodies and so on uh, so they have that role glycoproteins glycolipids and so on interestingly nicholson 40 years later gave another slightly revised version of the cell membrane that is in 2013. So this is what people should, just slight modifications are there. I'm not going into that. But all I want to say at this stage is all living beings are surrounded by membranes. If you are looking for a law in biology, this could be one of that. Otherwise, we don't have universal laws. That is the problem with the biological science because biological whole system is so dynamic and for everything there are exceptions and therefore compared to universal laws of physics it is difficult to get laws in biology although we call Mendel's laws or uh, Harley Weinberg law uh, they again they also suffer from the strict definition of laws uh, for want of uh, uh, because due to exceptions and other changes that, that, that really are associated with that so universal laws are different, laws are different. And then uh, in biology, people are looking for laws actually. And that could be a topic for a talk uh, by some expert someday. Uh, but most of the, generally we don't find uh, so many laws uh, that are, that can be considered as universal laws. Now the second pillar of biology is a theory of evolution. This is an extremely important aspect of biology. For a long time, evolution was neglected for a variety of reasons. There are philosophers, the scientists, the politicians, so many people are involved, and it is difficult to give a theory that will satisfy everybody. For example, Karl Popper said, Oh, you can't have a theory like that where you say survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest, obviously, the fittest will survive. It is a tautology and it cannot be falsified. So that type of problems were also there. Anyway, today it's all overcome. People have started accepting theory of evolution that was given by Darwin and Wallace together in 1858. The major aspect of this theory is that the organisms evolve over time. That is, they're not uh, stagnant. They change over time. And how they change or why they change? That is in response to environmental pressures. Whatever may be the pressure in the environment, maybe predator, maybe parasite, maybe resources, maybe other problems. Finally, in order to survive, changes occur in the population of uh, 
uh, a given species and they keep evolving. Therefore, today, most biological phenomena, that is what we call form and function, have evolutionary origins. Why do we cough? Why do we have a fever? Why do we do this or that? Behavior, depression, anything you think of have evolutionary origins. So Darwin published his book in 1859, which was titled On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And the subtitle was Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Interesting thing is that on the day the book was released, all copies were sold. That was the popularity and excitement that the book enjoyed. And this is the book every biologist should own a copy. It costs around 250 rupees now. New editions are there. And every biologist should buy a copy of this book and keep it in the home as if it is a Bible or Bhagavad Gita for biology people. So Darwin proposed two theories. One is a descent with modification in the process of which selection or elimination of traits, uh, traits, he said, because at that time, the term genes was not there. So now we know traits actually refer to genes and that leads to origin of new species and so on. And what is the basic mechanism of evolution? That is natural selection. Of course, today my talk is not on evolution, so I just mentioned leaving. What is the importance of evolution is that now evolution is a core theme in biology. That is central theme in biology. Everything revolves around evolution. And only through evolutionary perspective, we can understand biology in a much better way. I'll give you an analogy wherein I'm using a computer. Computers require an operating system, as you know. Now we have Windows 10, earlier it was Windows 7 and so on, Windows 8, whatever. So you need an operating system, otherwise computer is just a box, nothing, it cannot do anything. And then just having an operating system is not enough. You also need software, various software, whether it is the one to PPT, the Word or Excel or blah, 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 so many things. So they, if you have operating system, you have a software, then the computer can work. Now you may ask me, what has that got to do with uh, biology? In biology, what is the operating system? One can ask. So now it is clear that evolution is the operating system, form and function are byproducts of evolution. That's what we try to say. This is my crude analogy. And then what are the software and apps? Anatomy, physiology, biodiversity, behavior, development, genetic, molecular biology, taxonomy, and so on. We study in isolation, all these things. They are like our softwares and apps. Oh, you want to study taxonomy, go to that app and look at all the taxonomical things. You want to study molecular biology, have an app on molecular biology and look into that, that kind of a situation. So what is the major focus is that evolution is the operating system that guides form and function of byproducts, uh, which are byproducts of evolution. So everything that we see for function, behavior, etc., are the result of evolutionary processes, evolutionary pressures, based on which the animals, various species from amoeba or bacteria or to human being are shaped. Now, third pillar is the principles of inheritance, which came in 1865 or so. Gregor John Mendel was a monk, considered father of genetics because he discovered genetics. Before that, we did not know. And he did not know also about genes. He only talked about factors and the traits. The major finding that Mendel gave us is that there are at least two kinds of things. The dominant and recessive traits are there, and they are discrete. That means they are separate. They do not blend the following crossing. Even if you cross white pigeon and a black pigeon, you are not likely to get a brown pigeon. Either you get black or you get white, but not mixed one. It's not like colors. You mix two colors and you get a third color. It doesn't happen. So this was one thing uh, that is very important, he said. One is the dominant trait, 
recessive trait and not blending. These are the three important points that he made at that time, but then people forgot about genetics for a long time and it had to be just as the Darwin's theory of evolution, Mendel's uh, work also had to be rediscovered after a few years, maybe 50 years or whatever. Rangnath is there, he's the expert. If you have any question on genetics, you can shoot at him. Now, fourth pillar of biology, and a very important one, is the principles of coding. Okay, we have traits, we have characters, we have... How is that these are coded and transmitted? The work of Watson and Crick gave us the DNA model in 1953, as you know, the double helix and all that. And they also, the model also provided for proper replication of uh, the DNA molecules so that during crossing over, during separation to offspring, they can be faithfully transmitted and so on. And of course, they got Nobel Prize. Then Hargovin Kurana, people say he would have got more than at least two Nobel Prizes. He gave us the principles of coding, what a code means and how it is transmitted, uh, how it contains genetic information what, and how it is transmitted. So these are the most important development that paved the way for today's molecular balance. Without DNA structure, without knowing the coding and genetic information, transmission, etc., there would not have been any molecular biology, nor there would have been uh, biotechnology in the way it is there today, and also computational biology or systems biology and so on. So this is the fourth pillar on which biology rests, and more to the 21st century is going to operate on this fourth pillar. Now, DNA is often considered as the blueprint of life because that is the one that is involved in uh, producing the mRNAs, that is the transcription through transcription and transcription factors. And these, when translated, give us the protein. Protein helps us in altered cell function. It may be synthesis, maybe production of enzymes, maybe degradation, transportation, permeability, all, in you know, anything. Uh, hormones, whatever, proteins, protein hormones, of course, uh, this is very essential. And then, of course, in addition to the messenger RNA, it also produces two other kinds of RNA which are themselves functional. They are not translated, like ribozymes and tRNA. These are direct, they have a direct role without undergoing any translation. So, therefore, all cellular functions as well as behavior of organisms are regulated or controlled by genes. Therefore, often one thinks DNA is the blueprint of life. All right. Now, is the blueprint same as our blueprint that we use for building houses or other buildings and so on? Actually, it is not. This is the blueprint for building a house or a school or a college or whatever that is. But such blueprints give some idea about the building under construction, but do not tell how to build it. If you look at the blueprint, you get some idea as to how the building is likely to look, but the blueprint itself does not tell you how to build the house. So whereas DNA is a different story. Oh God, something is missing. Uh, one minute, one minute, one minute. Uh, some slides are gone here and there. Okay, let it be. Uh, DNA tells us more. Uh, I'll come back to, maybe I'll go back and come back. Okay. Building an organism, however, is a complex process, not like building a house and so on. For example, you start with uh, an egg, then you get a frog or a fish or a human body or whatever. So, this is a very, very complex process, which we did not understand for a long time, but I will tell you this and go back to that. One of the challenges is that uh, axis formation is important in the development. What is axis formation? Axis formation left make, refers to making left and right side of the body, dorsal and ventral side of the body, anterior, posterior side of the body, so that sense organs, etc., are placed at a right to place, so axis formation is extremely important. So developmental processes, therefore, 
if all this has to be accomplished, you need a developmental process that requires program of instructions. It is not just DNA sitting there doing, doing nothing. No. DNA is there, but DNA provides for what we call generative and descriptive programs. It keeps us telling, okay, first you have done this, next is this, next is this, all this will go on, giving instructions. In other words, at appropriate time, cell movements, production of substances, proteins, etc., hormones, whatever is needed, are produced at the right time so that whole organism is actually produced properly. So development is a complex process. Why development is a complex process? I will come back to that and tell you. We have understood development only recently. How does development help make, I mean, how do you make a baby, for example? How does it happen? For a long time, it was felt that God must have created a miniature human being or a frog or whatever you think of that is placed. Earlier day people thought in sperm and that develops gradually into human being. Sperms were easily seeable things that again it has a big history as I said before Sperms were thought to be parasites or worms in a semen, but when these early microscopists people were people were interested in saw them in the semen of all mammals, they thought there is something different, something more to that. <clears throat> also, people knew that without the union of male and female individuals, pregnancy doesn't take place and children are not produced. So they thought. Okay, there must be something in sperm. Some sperm must be responsible for having this miniature adult in it, and that somehow gets larger in the in the female body. But the female body provides only nourishment, and the growth occurs, and baby is produced. Role of egg was not appreciated or understood because how would you see human egg? It's very difficult. Actually, we started seeing human eggs only in the last century that in the middle of the last century, more so after in vitro fertilization and other things started coming. First, we saw, of course, in mouse, rat, and other things, super ovulation, other problems uh, were uh, sorted out. So eggs were not seen, eggs were not recognized, their presence, etc., were not there. Later, only later in the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century, maybe eggs uh, also felt important. So we have a spermish theory and the ovism theory and all that. So it was basically believed whether you go by sperm or egg, but never the importance of fertilization was that was no. They said God must have created man miniature adult and kept either in the sperm or in the egg. Later they said both in the sperm and egg, and they used develop. Later. However, there are other school of thought, epigenesis, epigenesis, who said. No, no, it doesn't happen this way. It is not that a miniature adult is put there. It is not possible. There's some kind of jelly is there and undifferentiated tissue is forms and later differentiation occurs gradually they are produced. These were people who were labeled as atheists, but it is not so. They were not atheists. They did believe in God, but they did not believe that every embryo is made by God only. No, that was the only, that, that was the problem. Now, just look at this, the Newton uh, view also had a problem with the biology people. There were three laws of mechanics described, uh, you know, a clockwork universe made by God. And uh, he said understood and celebrated by scientists. Newton, 17th century, gave three laws of uh, mechanics. And he said he also gave a model, clockwork universe, wherein uh, he said, uh, the terrestrial mechanics and celestial movements are essentially the same. And further, he said, God makes and fits minute cogs in the wheel together and sets them running. It goes on. And what science does or scientists do is locate these and describe their movements. And in a way, he supported preformation view. That was also interesting to note. But however, Immanuel Kant differed with Newton. 
He said it is impossible to understand production of even a grass blade merely based on cause. Just because of some cause, you cannot explain uh, how a grass blade grows. So these were initial uh, responses on the development of uh, uh, babies or bodies. Anyway, only around 1980s, ideas began taking shape regarding fertilization when microscope became available. People could see fertilization in the microscope. Yet again, they did not know what sperm does uh, or what egg does. They thought maybe the electrical phenomena, sperm somehow excites and so on. But whatever that is, we understood something about fertilization, inheritance of cell, inheritance, though in 1865, Mendel had uh, talked about it, then the cell division and importance of chromosomes. Mendel also did not know what is the importance of chromosomes, or uh, they were not known at that time. But around the turn of the, therefore, the turn of the 19th century, foundation of cell biology was laid firmly. This I have already explained. Already. So anyway, uh, coming back to the modern knowledge, DNA is a more than a blueprint, yet DNA is not the destiny because certain epigenetic factors can silence or activate the genes. So today we have a totally new branch called epigenetics and more or less it has assumed actually more important than the genetics itself because people are interested in controlling diseases or otherwise whatever issues if we can switch off a gene that is silence a gene or activate a gene uh, that can have uh, value for human health and welfare so this is what a DNA is a blueprint, but it's more than a blueprint, not typical of our uh, building blueprint. That's what I'm trying to say because they provide descriptive programs. Now, what do we have we achieved in biology so far? I'm again jumping now. There are so many, like a biotechnology, fisheries, GMO. That is, you know, when you say fisheries, that is a blue revolution. Genetically modified organisms were able to produce genetically modified food. We are able to produce green revolution, cloning, gene therapy. Of course, it is uh, talked about since 50 years now, but uh, not so much uh, impact it has made. Genetic engineering, yes, all these things. Our human genome product uh, for sequencing, which was completed in 2001, started in 1999, 2001. So today we have entire horoscope of all, all our 23 pairs of chromosomes. We know everything about that. And in vitro fertilization, testive baby production is, has become a routine thing today. In vitro production of hormones, uh, proteins is a common feature today. Insulin, for example, today which we use is uh, made by bacteria uh, and not by, uh, <clears throat> we don't take that anymore from uh, slaughterhouses, pancreas and so on. Now, increase in milk production, white revolution has taken place, eggs and meat production has taken place, pharma agriculture is there. You inject a required, which a desired gene and the adder of uh, this cattle, and then you can get, uh, for example, factor nine uh, associated with the blood clotting in our milk, you can get that. Then stem cell biology is again, uh, there's a lot of hype, uh, but uh, still progress is, uh, uh, we have to await the real progress. People thought of ordering for our own kidney, our own liver, our own things using stem cells so that whenever I need, I can get back my uh, kidney made out of my own cells and so on. But that has not yet happened. What has happened is the stem cell biology is able to produce nerve cells, liver cells, kidney cells, etc. But not the organ per se. That is there. It is stuck. Maybe someday we will have that. And of course, vaccine production, biofilms, genotransplantation, that is transplantation of organs from one species to another. Like, for example, pig organs seem to be very compatible with the human. So whether it's kidney or a heart, but again, these are still not fully successful. Uh, still a lot of research is necessary to avoid rejection and so on. So I listed a few uh, examples as our major achievements in biology today. Now, 
a brief word about biology in 21st century. Biology in 21st, that is the current century, there will be more and more of computational biology. Computational biology because of uh, enormous amount of data we have, but we cannot handle. That is in the exabyte level. Bioinformatics, systems biology, in, in silico biology, these are all terms we use, have emerged in recent decades following the accumulation of gigantic data, which is in exabyte. That is impossible to handle without computers. So computational biology has become uh, essential. Computational tools include mathematical, statistical modeling, algorithms, simulation, etc. For example, where is the cell I'm trying to show? And this has some 3,500 uh, protein molecules. So if you inject a drug, it's, how does the drug interact with any of these? How does they do it? So all this can be studied using software in the computer. So this refers to system biology often refers to study of molecular interactions within a cell. So how does it happen? So we don't have, because we cannot go into the cell and see, it is only it has to be done through computers and so on. In a closing comment, I want to say that all phenomena, all biological phenomena have certain causes. True. One is proximate causes. But these explain what and how questions, what has happened, this has happened, how it has happened, so and so. For example, you take uh, uh, antibiotic resistance. So we don't respond to antibiotics. Then doctor will say, oh, he has become resistant to antibiotics. Okay, that is what question. Then how? How because bacteria has, uh, you go further deeper into the study, you know, that it may have an efflux pump, which is uh, sending out all antibiotic outside the body of for bacteria, or it is denaturing by binding with some proteins, or uh, it is uh, killing it, dividing it, so that antibiotic becomes ineffective and so on. So this one can happen. But the question is, is that enough to know what and how? We need what is the ultimate causes of resistance, for example. Explaining such causes is an attempt to answer why question. Why questions are difficult. So in case of uh, resistance, again, antibiotic resistance by the bacteria, it is not the person who is becoming resistant, it is the bacteria which becomes resistant. So why questions can explain us uh, why it has become uh, resistant. That is in actually an evolutionary process because those bacteria which have genes to deal with the antibiotic survive, others die. And when they survive, they leave their progeny with uh, endowed, that are already endowed with the genes. And therefore, they multiply. And when you give antibiotic, they don't respond to that anymore. So it is an evolutionary process. So if you understand that antibiotic resistance is due to evolution, then you know how to deal with that. Then we learn management of uh, antibiotic resistance uh, rather than simply go on giving anti uh, antibiotics. So we need to ask in biology all three questions. To understand diverse biological phenomena, we should ask what, how, and why questions. And sh then only you can shed light on several unsolved issues in biology. It's very important. And future biology or biologists may even think of answering what is consciousness, what is mind, and uh, uh, whether animals do think. So many questions are involved. Often we think mind and body are separate. That is the dualism, what we call. That is a Dvaita philosophy kind of thing. But there are other views. They say, no, mind and body cannot be separate. They are the same. Because suppose you imagine something that funny thing happened 20 years back, you start blushing. So if body and mind are not connected, why do you blush thinking or remembering something that happened 20 years back? So these are all fundamental, very nice issues, uh, which uh, there are many unsolved issues uh, in biology, which people can probably work. So biology is a dynamic subject, and it is not as simple as chemistry becoming life. But it's much more than that. And the realm of biology is also far and wide. It needs everyone. For example, ultimately all cells, everything, everything, a body is made of particles. What is that? That is ultimately hydrogen or whatever atoms. And then, but who will describe the, the structure, the, the layers of the atom? It's the physicists who will describe that. Biologists cannot. 
but then where do you stop the biological system are since they are made up of uh, atoms uh, molecules and so on all universal laws applicable to those outside the body are also applicable inside the body that is what uh, happens so there are many many complicated issues in uh, biology biology is a challenging field the more you go into deeper of it deep insight the more challenges more unsolved issues will arise so i think i'll stop at this point uh, and i thank you this is my university thank you very much sir uh, thank you very much for a very scholarly and insightful talk on biological sciences basic insights you covered the progression of uh, biological sciences then major landmarks including darwinism mendelism rogoin purana dna etc and major achievements and 21st century biology it was really a very uh, insightful sir we all got a good uh, overview of uh, bio biological science sir and professor muli mani sir and dr ekna sir for their uh, comments uh, professor muli mani sir <laughs> no there is professor ranath he can uh, really throw more light and better life but god is brought into the whole thing you know epigenesis sir card attest uh, i don't understand that it's, uh, and uh, this death of death nowadays people are talking that is whether aging can be slowed down whether professor ranganath can throw light professor saidapur and another point is this epigenetics genes are not destiny these are my three things well, i'll just can answer thank you ranganath sir Uh, now I request Dr. Ekna sir. Actually, I think it was uh, as some as Dr. Ranganath was, had pointed it out uh, in the chat chat box. It's a excellent uh, distillation of about billions of years ago what happened in uh, and then the modern biology which really it's took about 100 to 150 years. He has condensed that within about 45 minutes and given us the glimpses of uh, this one. So it was very enjoyable. And for me, especially personally speaking, I, I felt that I really needed this kind of a framework at this age anyway. That framework which he put together as the principles and uh, the, uh, the, the pillars of biology and how one led to the other and how everything has been coming. I think it has been very, very well explained. Thank you very much, sir. I think today oh, one hour was well spent for me. Thank you very much, even at this age. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Our uh, Kushal Das, sir, is there. He joined a bit late, sir. Over to you. Unmute, sir. Kushalda, sir, unmute. I think, sir, Professor Rangana, sir, wants to say something or he is unable to. Yeah, I called him twice or thrice. I, I don't know. Uh, Professor Rangana, sir. Sir is raising hand, but voice yeah, he's is there. Not he's there. My video is on. Yeah, <laughs> video is on. Sir, unmute. Unmute, Madi, sir. Care style. Rangnath sir, unmute, unmute Madi sir. Unmute Madi Dinu sir. Ah, ah yeah, Bantu Nadi. Sir, yes. 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 So I have written in the mute box, it's an excellent, concise overview. So he has summed up the story from the almost from the origin of life today. And particularly for students, he has opened up so many windows today. So with whomsoever interested in that, those people can open the windows and uh, read more and more. It could be developmental biology, it could be genetics, it could be evolution. 
So he has shown how multiple ways of looking at the life today and uh, the spectrum, the canvas are so huge and he has painted the story of uh, biology so well. And now the students have to make use of it so that whichever, whichever window they can, what they are interested, they can open up and read it. As uh, Eknath said, irrespective of the age, it was an enlightening talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. Now, uh, Dr. Kushal Das, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, at the onset, I must give thanks to Dr. A. R M. Ramesh KSTA for giving me a chance. Actually, I entered, I listened the entire talk through mobile. Unfortunately, I was unable to put it to the laptop, so I requested Ramesh, sir, that do something that I can enter to the laptop. So later I got the link in the laptop and then I opened it. And it's a great pleasure to see the stalwart giants like Professor S.K. Saidapur sir, H.N. Rangana sir, and my mentor, Professor Mulimuni sir, Professor Ekna sir. It's always a pleasure to listen all of them because they are my ideal, actually they're my iconic figure in front of me when I do something. And I feel myself and I measure that where I stand because they are the giants and I am the pygmy. So I have nothing to say about Professor SK Saidapur sir because I listen to him quite a long and a lot of lectures I listen in. Always is interesting and very different from each of the talk in a different way. And being a medical person and medical scientist, this talk. I feel it is so relevant when it comes to the picture of the biology science as a whole. Very unfortunately, in medical science, the moment they become a medical scientist or the moment they become a pharmacist or pharmaceutical scientist or agriculture scientist, they, they just make them excluded from the biological sciences. This is the tendency in India and all the university professional when it goes to medical or pharmacy or even the other branches or discipline. This is a very unique because what Professor Saidapur sir say, as a medical scientist, I know very well each of the points are actually we are using. He actually narrated the story of evolution, story of the origin of cell to how it ultimately gives a genome and then it can be exploded in the various types of practical uh, clinical or practical applications. But thing is that when medical scientists, they decide or they discuss, they kept them out. This is the picture in India is a very peculiar in this regard. I have never seen, never seen in my life in whether it is in AIMS or NIMANS or in the top premier institute of India when I discuss with my colleague and friends to claim them they are first a biologist. This is what they never say. This is the lacunae I think that we are all having. This identity actually keeping out from the knowledge domain from other and result we clearly found when the COVID-19 break broken out and clearly seen that medical scientists are unable to actually do the experiment on real time because they have never done it. So this lacking is so nakedly exposed and many institutions, including I know from the a private institution, people have been borrowed to the medical institution to give a support to the evaluation of the real time to find out the COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2. So still it has not been there. I think the biology itself is a great meaning. I must feel proud today when SARS discuss about the biology. Not only this lecture was said as given mainly for the students who are PU and who are career going to be done. But I felt myself that as if that I would have been that phase when I would have been here such a lecture and to keep my keep my career into a proper ways. I feel proud of to a biologist first before being a medical scientist. So I think this has a meaning of that. Sadly, explanation is very wonderful and very clear. I have only one points to ask you, this, as Professor Saidapur said, said, do you think that computational biology or in silico biology not yet included in pharmacology or medical curriculum? Do you think that biotechnology, this part, bioinformatics and computation, 
specifically computational biology need to be added to the medical curriculum because medical sure. curriculum is going completely like a patient see and treat only in India. This is not in the abroad. I have a vast experience in abroad. They do not do it. They teach everything. But here, too many clinical exposure, early clinical exposure, and directly they are going to the clinics. And fundamental thing they do not know. They do not know the idea of a molecules, they know the idea of a drug, and they read the pharmacology and its kinetics and its application. Do you think, sir, this modern and advanced knowledge in biology applicable to medical science need to be adopted by National Medical Council for this curriculum for continued the undergraduate? at least postgraduate medical curriculum what is your opinion sir yeah uh, certainly i mean uh, see the, when we study or teach there is no more this specializations are going to help we need to integrate today's my talk is not as a person uh, uh, you know for the 20 years i worked in the field of comparative technology and then remaining uh, years I worked in uh, animal behavior. But you know what I feel is we cannot remain specialists anymore. It's a different thing. They're doing the surgery, etc. Specialization is a different thing. But in biology, we have to be, we have to learn to integrate the different disciplines of biology and make sense of the whole story. Otherwise, just, uh, oh, I'm an expert in uh, molecular biology, somebody's expert in Texas. No, a little bit of everything everyone should know. So including computational biology in all biological sciences, including medical sciences is of course necessary. And the pharmacists are already doing it, drug designing and other things, they're already doing it. So this has to be done. One more thing I just wanted to tell, I forgot, um, that you know the, the theory people used to use that a sperm containing uh, the miniature adult and then you know helping and using woman's womb only as a uh, lodging for development may many people think that the male dominance and that is how it is said the titles the surname for example or titles and fortunes their properties etc go to the children because from the male side not from the female side our, our, our children inherit my surname i mean your surname and not mother's surname, because that was the kind of a dominance that in those days, and we continue to do that. So, um, I, of course, I didn't want to go into too much of historical side, but today, where we teach, we also need to teach history of biology. We, we cannot simply forget, we have to have integrated approach to teaching of biology. Only then we understand biology in a holistic way, otherwise, Oh, I'm specialized in adrenal gland. I don't know about thyroid. No, that is no more uh, no valid. So this, the so, so specializations are actually vanishing. Slowly, its integration has to occur. New education policy also says integration, but often we don't realize what is integration. That is our uh, real trouble. Do we need to study everything separately? No, it's not necessary. So that is how it is. Uh, but anyway, that is another. Uh, discussion yeah, but uh, unfortunately uh, sir the national uh, education policy could not able to enter into the field of medicine and law mm, yeah sure so where actually they are required more yes because, yes because in the world in us the medical education system is like that they complete md for four years before that four years in a biological sciences for four years then four years for md and yeah. then they have a yeah. residency for seven Three to yeah. seven years depend on the branches. Suppose it's in internal medicine, it is said three years. Yeah. If it is in neurosurgery, it is seven years. So they yeah. become in this group, they go for it. And they then call MD in neurosurgery, MD in. Yeah. But exactly. India, they made again another division. There yeah. is already competition, then again made a super specialty, specialty, then super specialty. Yes. What is the meaning of that to take no. anything suggesting no. American, the American system? But actually, uh, NMC and Medical Council and Health Ministry going in another system. Is it not a contrast by the government to have the two contradictory policy? See, basic knowledge of biology is very, very necessary. I know a friend of mine was a graduate student doing his PhD when I was in a Kansas Medical Center. And uh, after doing PhD, 
later he joined a medicine and now today is a leading doctor because he knows the basic things and also the other things I mean, that is how it happens so basic knowledge there's no substitute for that and the integration the integrated knowledge is essential but today people you know of course there was a time when specialization had importance but today uh, we are going back and trying to understand things in a different way, in a holistic way. Yeah. Right. For example, without evolution, from a evolutionary perspective, you cannot understand a disease also. Why it has happened? Why will you get fevers? Why do you cough? Why do you, oh, in the first trimester, why do the pregnant woman uh, uh, have a, this, this, what do you call, uh, <clears throat> hmm. I mean, morning sickness? Morning sickness, for example. Why? Why? See, see these, these are all adaptive features developed in the course of evolution. And we cannot simply neglect that. You know, the evolutionary medicine is there today. Even fisheries, anything you take, um, evolution has to be there. Basic principles of evolution we need to understand. Today we have, for example, evolutionary medicine, evolutionary fisheries, evolutionary, I mean, Darwinian agriculture. Darwinian psychology, even today depression, anxiety, fear, aggression, behavior are explained through evolutionary principles. So, that, I, I, in some of the medical college in USA, evolution is taught as in one of the semesters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? That, 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 here we don't. But yeah, just, don't that, and... one paper is enough. Just some idea they must get. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Rangnath, anything more? Yeah. We're all no. friends, they won't criticize me, I know, but if there's anything wrong, they can still tell me, correct me. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Ram Krishna and uh, Madam Sumangala Mamigati and Dr. Varsha. Uh, sure. From you. Dr. Yeah. Varsha, Dr. Sumangala Mamigati, Madam, and Dr. Ram Krishna. Yeah, please. Hello. 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 Is it audible, sir? Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna. Yeah. Good afternoon to all of you, sir. Very ah, really kind of yeah. to listen an excellent lecture by Professor Sairapur. Uh, it was a great experience for me. Uh, and he condensed the entire course of uh, zoology or biology as a whole from starting from the origin of art to the modern computational science or the bioinformatics. So he has wonderfully done well. So I really I congratulate well. Uh, congratulate uh, Professor Sairapur for an excellent uh, deliberation, sir. So thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sumangala, mommy. Hmm. Uh, sir, then uh, link to the Kalsey and Teli got Jana either, madam. So, sir, thank you very much for a very scholarly talk on uh, biological sciences. We are on behalf of PSTA, we are very grateful to you for your time. In fact, uh, you are busy when I requested you for a talk. In spite of your busy schedule, you are great to deliver this wonderful talk on behalf of PSTA and all the participants, including students. I am very grateful to you for your talk, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I am also, th also thankful to our esteemed PSTA members, Professor H. A. Rangnath, sir, Professor Mulimani, sir. Dr. Eknath sir and also Dr. Kushal Das sir for their presence and also I am thankful to Dr. Ramkrishna sir and Sumangala Mamigati and Dr. Varsha for joining this talk. Thank you very much sir. Grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar.